This and conference thank you will now be for recorded. All, for, to all the organizers and participants um, for pulling this together. This is um, some really um, awesome content um, from the last one and really looking forward to the talk today. Um, so thank you to all of you. We're, we're really happy to be able to sit in and, and listen to all of this. Um, really quick housekeeping for folks. Please keep yourself on mute uh, throughout the, the talks until the Q&A session, um, just to minimize any chance of background noise. We also ask, um, although we do love seeing all of your faces, because there's so many people on this call, we will ask that you turn your camera off um, unless you are presenting, um, just to, uh, again, create room on everybody's screens. Um, once we get to the Q&A section, um, obviously then you can um, unmute yourself and join into the conversation. Uh, I will note that there's a chat function. Um, so if you do want to send any questions um, to the authors um, for the, and the organizers uh, to come back to later. You can put that into the chat section. Uh, you can also send chats directly to the organizers if you're having any technological issues. Uh, there's me and a couple other folks on this call who will be able to receive those chats and answer to you directly if you need any tech support throughout. I do recommend if you have other browsers open, I'm one of those people that tends to have like 30 tabs open on my browsers. I do recommend closing them uh, as that can cause interruptions and so you may end up with some audio delay or video delay throughout the call. Other than that, I don't think I have any updates, uh, but please let me know if you have any questions about the software. The one thing I will note is there is an icon. Um, it looks like two circles with a video camera on it and that will separate the PowerPoint from the, um, the actual uh, video of the person. And so depending on your setup, um, that'll separate it into two windows. And sometimes that can allow you to expand the window a little bit more to see it a little bigger on your screen, depending on your setup. So you can use that as well. Otherwise, I'm gonna mute myself, turn my video off, and I will be standing by in the chat box and uh, looking forward to some really great talks today. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Emma. So um, before we get any further, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Christy Martin with the Coordinating Group on Alien Pest Species and just a little bit of history about this, uh, what we're turning into a webinar series. Uh, it really started out a few, well, about a year and a half ago um, with an effort to form a community of practice uh, between the climate change and invasive species communities. We saw this as um, being fairly separate entities and the more we work together and learn from each other, um, the better off we will be in planning for really two um, uh, wicked problems and their convergence. So uh, just thank you to our original organizer, Deanna Spooner, who um, had the vision to try to get together a, uh, um, a session, a workshop session during the Hoyt Conservation uh, Conference. Uh, this was last year, the 2019 session. Unfortunately, we weren't able to hold that. So instead, we went into high gear and we did a, um, a survey of practitioners uh, to figure out what, what areas we could fill as far as this, um, this gap in bringing together these two communities. So our first webinar was May 5th, and you can find the recording of that if you're interested in going to see that. Um, on uh, one of the links that we sent out to this group. We'll also be posting it to all of you folks who registered, so we'll follow up on that. Uh, we will also provide this recording to you folks, and of course we plan to have additional webinars. So this one in particular is gonna focus on the intersection between climate change, invasive species, and water. And we have two experts in this field. We're so grateful for their um, time and their uh, their knowledge sharing today. First off, we'll have Alan Mayer. Dr. Mayer is a hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey's Pacific Island Water Science Center based on Oahu, but working statewide and across the Pacific. His research focuses on quantifying the effects of climate change and land cover changes on water resources in Hawaii. He received his PhD in natural resources and environmental management from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And before joining USGS, he completed a postdoctoral uh, fellowship at UH Manoa with the Water Resources Research Center and Department of Geology and Geophysics. So mahalo, Dr. Mayor. We also have uh, Dr. Tom Jambaluka. He is the director of the Water Resources Research Center and a professor of geography and environment at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. 
He specializes in climatology and hydrology of tropical environments. Dr. Jambaluka's research is focused on land atmosphere interaction under changing land cover and changing global climate. Uh, in Hawaii, one aspect of his work aims at improving the understanding of Hawaii's climate, how it has changed over the past century, how it's likely to change in the future, and how the changes have and will affect hydrological processes and terrestrial ecosystems. He also studies, like he doesn't have enough to do, he also studies the effects of biological invasions in Hawaii, particularly by alien tree species such as strawberry guava, uh, and those um, effects on water, soils, and carbon storage. So we'll hear from these two experts first, and then we will have a question and answer period that's going to be facilitated by Laura Bruin. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over the presentation uh, to Dr. Mayer to get started. Alan, we saw your screen for a second. But I don't yeah, see it. I'm sorry. Yeah, can you, sorry, Christy, can you send that again? Send the sharing pop up? Maybe, Emma, if you can share the screen icon. Emma, are you able to send the screen sharing icon? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, do you folks, you see the, the presentation? Are we good to go? No, we see your um, desktop file. The file's open. now okay are we good to go looks great thank you yeah okay thanks guys sorry about that okay good afternoon everyone um, thank you very much Christy and to the invasive species climate change working group for inviting Tom and I to uh, speak today my talk today will briefly describe the nature of USGS monitoring research and assessments here in Hawaii and the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands, as well as ongoing studies to address fundamental questions related to freshwater availability here in the state of Hawaii. These questions include what are the hydrologic impacts of non-native forest species and climate variability on critical processes such as groundwater recharge, and how will the potential spread of non-native forest species and climate change affect freshwater availability? My presentation today is divided into four elements, main elements. The first part, I'll, I'll talk a little bit of background about the USGS Water Science Center and what we do. Um, and then I'll talk about one of the main tools that we use to assess the impacts of climate change and land cover change on freshwater availability here in Hawaii. And then next, I'll describe the results of a recent study that we collaborated with, uh, with Tom and his group at UH Manoa and then finally, I'll wrap up with some proposed next steps on and where we're headed. So here at the Pacific uh, Islands Water Science Center, our funding partners look to us to provide information 
needed to help manage, protect, and enhance water resources. We also helped them to address water-related hazards such as flooding. And unlike other federal agencies, USGS does not have a regulatory role. Most importantly, we strive to provide publicly accessible information that is actionable, reliable, impartial, impartial and timely. Our process for developing actionable science begins with engaging resource managers and stakeholders to better understand their information needs and management objectives. After reviewing available information, we can then define data collection needs and develop appropriate models that can be used to assess what if scenarios. What if scenarios are then used to, con to evaluate constraints on water availability as well as management options to minimize adverse impacts. This requires in-depth communication and understanding between scientists and resource managers. Our center has and will continue to look to support informed decision-making by developing structured decision support tools in collaboration with resource managers. We feel strongly that long-term monitoring of rainfall, stream flow, and groundwater is critical for assessing status and trends and ultimately water availability. With the support from about 15 federal, state, and county agencies, we operate reference sites to assess effects of climate change on water availability, water resource management sites to assess effects of land and water use change, and third, flood alert and peak stream flow sites to help protect life and property. We are fortunate to have an extremely talented staff that is recognized nationally for their ability to collect high quality stream flow and sus suspended sediment data in flashy streams. Our, so our staff also operates a robust network of flood alert gauges. And as some of you may know, we maintain an online database called NWIS that provides online access to our rainfall, stream flow, groundwater, and water quality data. Historically, water resource monitoring in Hawaii expanded and declined in tandem with the needs of plantation agriculture. This is easily seen in the history of surface water gauging stations across the state shown here in the, in the plot on the left of your screen. What we're left to, with today are the most, only the most critical gauges, which creates resource, resource management challenges as demands for information increase while budgets stay relatively flat. However, since 2015, the stream gauge network has increased statewide with support from the State of Hawaii Commission on Water Resource Management and on Oahu with the support from the city and county of Honolulu. We focus our research and assessments on three water related issues. First, groundwater availability, also quantity and variability of stream flow, stream flow and water quality related to land use. The potential adverse impacts of climate variability and change on surface water and groundwater availability are an overarching theme for our work. Groundwater availability has been and will continue to be a major water resource issue here in Hawaii. As a result, we have been developing improved water budgets for estimating impacts of climate and land cover change on groundwater recharge. In addition, we have been developing numerical groundwater models to support management decisions related to saltwater intrusion, groundwater levels, and reduction in groundwater discharge to streams and nearshore ecosystems. These water budget and groundwater modeling efforts have been supported by agencies such as the USGS Water Availability and Use Science Program, the US Department of the Interior Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center, the State of Hawaii Commission on Water Resource Management, Maui County Department of Water Supply, the Honolulu Board of Water Supply, and others. So the question arises, why is quantifying groundwater recharge important? Well, estimates of groundwater recharge are critical inputs to water budget models for determining potential impacts to groundwater availability, which resource managers need to manage their freshwater resources. Examples include identifying areas of potential vulnerability where changes may impact groundwater availability. 
Also, use of a groundwater model, such as a, the robust analytical model or RAM to compute the sustainable yield, or a numerical groundwater model to quantify how human and natural changes impact groundwater availability. Shown here on the right is a diagram showing you the water cycle, uh, conceptualized water cycle here in Hawaii. So the issue is if we know that conversion of native forest to non-native forest species may affect rates of cloud water interception or fog drip, evapotranspiration or ET, infiltration, runoff, and groundwater recharge. From a water resource perspective, some management efforts aim to increase rates of cloud water interception, infiltration, and groundwater recharge, while at the same time decreasing rates of stormwater, stormwater runoff and evapotranspiration. So some discussion of what we do know. We do know that some native plants in some settings tend to use less water than some non-native plants. Uh, although this is based on limited data. We also know that native and non-native plants in some set settings intercept substantial cloud water. And finally, we know that groundwater recharge is controlled ma excuse me, mainly by rainfall, but also by ET cloud water interception and runoff. What we don't know is how species and settings can affect these rates. So for example, how does ET differ among species and how does it change with different settings? And the same goes for cloud water interception and runoff generation. Also, how does forest structure affect these processes as well? So we know, as I've said, we know that some native and non-native forest species transpire, intercept cloud water at different rates, but this is limited to a couple species and an only limited settings, limited number of settings. Information from across a range of settings, specifically different rainfall regimes, soil types, elevations with respect to the cloud zone aspect are lacking. So one of the, what, one of the first steps our center uh, undertook was compiling a summary of relevant literature and shown here is a graphic of a summary of over 50 studies conducted here in the state of Hawaii for evaluating the effects of watershed management and restoration on different processes in the water cycle. This tabular summary, summary briefly describes the objective approach and findings of these studies and includes a link at the end to, to download or obtain each publication. I've given a copy of this summary table to Christy and uh, she can distribute to interested participants. So after reviewing the literature, these findings um, lead us to two, two conclusions. One, that studies on how vegetation affect individual hydro, hydrologic components, such as cloud water interception, infiltration, and runoff are necessary, but they're not sufficient to evaluate the regional impact of land management on water resources. Therefore, we believe that water budgets and watershed models are needed to synthesize this information um, for these different individual hydrologic components and provide a way to evaluate the regional impact of land management on water resources. So now I wanna talk a little bit about how we do that. How do we estimate recharge? Our center has developed a computer code to estimate regional groundwater recharge rates using a water budget approach. The code requires input data that quantify the spatial and temporal distribution of precipitation, land cover, soils, runoff, and ET. The code can also incorporate inputs of cloud water interception or fog drip, irrigation, seepage from wetland taro, reservoirs, and septic systems, as well as leakage from water mains. These models are useful for estimating the impacts of land cover and climate change on recharge and can help to provide critical information for evaluating the benefits of watershed management. One example application of a water budget model approach includes the Hawaii Groundwater Recharge Tool. 
This tool was developed by USGS, including my colleagues Scott Izuka and Koyo Rotsal, in collaboration with the University of Hawaii through the EKVI program to assist researchers, stakeholders, and resource managers in their decision making. This web-based decision support tool allows a user to quickly evaluate how some kinds of changes in land cover and rainfall might affect groundwater recharge. The tool is a pilot website that is currently limited only to the island of Oahu, but it is designed to be expandable so that other islands can be added in the future. Another example of the water budget approach includes a recently published study led by Laura Brewington and Vicki Keener of the Pacific RESA program. The objective of this study was to understand how plausible changes in land cover could influence groundwater recharge rates for selected climate projections on the island of Maui. Their findings suggest that land management strategies can potentially offset the effects of a drying climate. For example, they found that conversions of grassland to forest within the cloud zone can increase cloud water or fog drip, interception, and recharge rates. However, they also found that substantial increases in irrigation might be needed to support the agriculture identified in their future or their plausible land cover scenarios. So whereas we have the tool to um, estimate groundwater recharge, the tool is only as good as the information we put into it. So we've identified a set of information needs to further refine and reduce the uncertainty in our recharge estimates using the water budget model approach. These include improved estimates of how native and non-native forest species affect runoff, canopy evaporation, and cloud water inter interception, improved information on transpiration rates of different forest species both inside and outside the cloud zone, and vegetation root depths for different forest species, as this may be an important control on evapotranspiration. And finally, information on how changes in forest structure can affect these processes, including ET and cloud water interception. To begin to address these information needs, our center conducted a collaborative study with the University of Hawaii at Manoa, specifically Tom Jambaluka and his group at the, at the Eco Hydrology Lab. And the study was comprised of two separately funded collab collaborative projects. The first funded project began in 2015 and involved a species identification, site selection, and limited field data collection program on the island of Maui with the support from the Maui County Department of Water Supply and the State of Hawaii Commission on Water Resource Management. The second funded project was begun in 2017 to supplement the Maui study and involved a species identification and site selection program on the islands of Kauai, Oahu, Molokai, and Hawaii. This second project was initiated in part to identify additional study sites on multiple islands for enhancing the transfer, excuse me, the statewide transferability of information. However, unlike the Maui project, this second supplementary project did not include field data collection. This project was supported by the State of Hawaii Division of Forestry and Wildlife. An overall objective of these two projects was to develop a statewide study design plan aimed at collecting data needed to quantify the hydrologic impacts of non-native forest species on freshwater availability across the state of Hawaii. So a little bit of background about the motivation for co conducting this study. We know that federal, state, and county government, county government agencies and private entities have invested substantial financial resources to manage watershed areas in Hawaii. For example, the Maui County De Department of Water Supply has invested more than $23 million since 1997 to support a variety of watershed management activities. However, the benefits of watershed management on freshwater su supply remain largely unquantified. We don't know yet the species-specific hydrologic impacts for many of Hawaii's most dominant forest species. Hence, additional information is needed to quantify these effects on freshwater availability. An overall goal of this collaborative study was to provide 
valuable information to assess the species specific impacts on freshwater availability and to provide critical inputs necessary to reduce the uncertainty in estimating regional recharge rates. And then finally, to provide information to help prioritize watershed management efforts. The study objectives included identifying high priority forest species and possible study, what, study sites. Uh, it also included a data collection program to quantify transpiration rates, total leaf area, and infiltration rates. And that, those were for the data collection on the island of Maui. And then lastly, uh, pull that information together to develop a statewide study design. The study involved a variety of activity, activities that included stakeholder workshops on four islands aimed at engaging the watershed partnerships, conservation groups, and representatives from the State Division of Forestry and Wildlife to identify non-native forest species of concern. It also involved conducting a review of 68 candidate study sites on five islands to identify suitable paired plot sites for further data collection. Our proposed study design called for making measurements in two adjacent or nearby plots for comparing forests dominated by native forest species with forests dominated by high priority, priority non-native species. And then also it included a limited data collection program on the island of Maui involving leaf area and leaf level measurements at four sites and infiltrometer testing at five sites. These field measurements were collected to assess how infiltration and transpiration rates are dependent on forest species type. So as a result of this process, uh, collab uh, collaborative process and the workshops on the different islands, we were able to identify a total of 33 high priority non-native forest species um, on five different islands. However, one of the, 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 the species were not necessarily prioritized just based on water resource con considerations. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. And we realize that it's difficult to determine, to determine which species have the greatest potential for water resource impacts without data collection, specifically ET measurements, infiltration measurements, as well as species distribution information. Shown here is the list of high priority non-native forest species identified during those workshops and our discussions with the stakeholders on the five islands. The list was developed using criteria such as current aerial extent, invasion potential, growth rate, existing research, and stakeholder interest. The workshop participants later helped to identify candidate study sites on these five islands However, during the course of our site reconnaissance, we were challenged to identify suitable paired plots for many of the identified species. We should note too that based on discussion with the Department of Forestry and Wildlife, we also included uh, grassland and pasture as a land cover class of interest during the recon. I've uh, given a copy of this table to Christy Martin who uh, can distribute again to the interested participants. A total of five sites were selected for infiltrometer testing on the island of Maui and we conducted leaf area and leaf level measurements uh, at four sites and Tom will talk about that um, during his following talk. Um, each site consists of paired plots comprised of one plot dominated by native forest species and one or more plots dominated by high priori priority non-native forest species or grassland. We conducted multiple infiltrometer tests at each of 13 plots identified at the five study sites. We then used the test results to estimate field saturated hydraulic conductivity or KFS, which is an indicator of infiltration potential. Shown here is a chart of, of the pool results for three land cover types observed at 11 plots. These include plots dominated by either grassland, non-native forest species, or native forest species. KFS is plotted along the y-axis 
and each of the three land cover types are indicated along the x-axis. Our results showed no significant difference in KFS between non-native forest species and native forest species. However, we did see significantly lower KFS or infiltration potential in grassland when compared to a non to non-native forest species. Other studies of infiltration across Hawaii have indicated similar findings. In 2018, Kim Perkins and other USGS researchers compiled results of KFS estimates from 290 test locations across five islands at plots that were dominated by trees and shrubs, grassland, and bare soil. They found that mean values of KFS were greater in trees and shrubs than grassland and bare soil, and with bare soil having the lowest KFS values among those three land groups. Most recently, my colleague Lucas Fortini and others conducted a study that involved measurements of KFS at over 600 locations at paired plot study sites on the islands of Kauai and Hawaii. Their pooled data sets did not show significant differences in KFS measurements between native and non-native forests or fenced and unfenced plots. However, they conducted additional field testing and data analysis to identify explanatory variables related to KFS. And those results identified a negative correlation of KFS with ungulate damage and a positive correlation with increased vegetative cover, greater presence of large roots, and lower grass and bare soil cover. So in terms of our study, the results of the candidate site review and reconnaissance indicated the need to modify our paired plot study design. Furthermore, the results from infiltrating, excuse me, infiltration testing indicated that differences between major land cover conversions such as grassland to forest or bare, or bare soil to grassland, but the results between native and non-native forests are equivocal. Although our data collection yielded valuable products in terms of species identification, candidate site identification, and species-specific field data collection, we believe the original concept for the statewide study design plan needed to shift away from an intensive and expensive continuous data collection program to an iterative approach with focus studies that address stakeholder management objectives and informs priorities for future efforts to quantify the impacts of non-native species on freshwater resources. So our proposed next steps uh, include four elements. The first is a species distribution mapping effort. Um, next is a data collection effort, and this would be led primarily by the University of Hawaii. Um, and I will let Tom talk a little bit more about these in the, the specific elements of that. Then third, we'd have a water budget modeling uh, step and uh, ending with a groundwater modeling step. And I'll talk a little bit about each step now. So in terms of the invasive species distribution mapping, the objectives here would be to, to do this to inform managers of current and potential range of forest species. And shown here on the right is a, an example that some of you may have seen, which maps the current and potential infestations of strawberry guava across the state. This information could also be used to prioritize data collection and areas for modeling. The next step includes a data collection uh, step and the overall study objective here is to understand how non-native species in Hawaii change ecosystem fluxes of water and impact water resources. And it's also being done to support the water budget and groundwater modeling um, efforts and, it, and would provide the inputs that we need for those efforts. And again, Tom will talk a bit more about this data collection effort. The next element is the water budget modeling component. And the objectives here would be one, to evaluate water budget component or ET uncertainty on groundwater recharge in watershed management areas 
and sustainable yield estimates by the State of Hawaii Commission on Water Resource Management. We'd also like to evaluate the importance of cloud water interception in mitigating the impacts of drought on groundwater recharge. And then finally, groundwater modeling with an objective to evaluate the impact of changes in recharge that we'd identify through our water budget modeling effort and it identified those changes in recharge on groundwater availability and critical infrastructure. Looking forward, uh, this table here is identifies some of our ongoing projects and proposed next steps. Um, in terms of the ongoing projects, we have a UH Manoa lead study um, that includes their Powell Flats anchor site that's being supported by the Honolulu Board of Water Supply. We also uh, recently beginning, I believe today is the official commencement of a, our water budget modeling effort to evaluate the sensitivity of the model to different inputs, and that's being funded by USGS. And then third, we have another water budget modeling study where we are looking at the importance of cloud water interception to mitigate the impacts of drought on groundwater recharge. And that's being supported by the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center. The other proposed next steps um, we have not identified uh, funding partners yet, but briefly, again, these are the ones that I just described, species mapping, data collection, and groundwater modeling. And then we've identified future steps that might include additional data collection or installation of, of, of uh, continuous monitoring sites. And this is my final slide, um, but I definitely want to recognize our funding partners, which include the state of Hawaii, Commission on Water Resource Management, the State of Hawaii Division of Forestry and Wildlife, the County of Maui Department of Water Supply, and the U.S. Department of the Interior Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center have all funded elements of this study in the water budget modeling and groundwater modeling efforts. Um, I also want to thank our collaborators, um, specifically the Ecohydrology Lab crew at University of Hawaii at Manoa for helping to collect uh, the data and conduct the field um, field work. Um, and the other folks too, uh, the Hawaii Community Foundation and Nature Conservancy and the Watershed Partnerships, those folks helped us with during the workshops with identifying the high priority species, as well as identifying candidate sites and then actually going out into the field and helping us find these sites. So a big mahalo to those folks as well. And with that, I'm, I'm all pal. So I will, Stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Mahalo, Alan. Thank you so much for that presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, we did get started just a little bit late, but I have to say you are exactly um, 30 minute timing. So perfect. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Tom uh, for his talk. Uh, we do expect a, a half hour talk and we will just shave a little bit of time off of our discussion at the end. But if I can encourage you folks, if you have questions along the way, if you could just type it into the chat box as well so that we have a record of it and we can follow up. Um, if not, you know, in person during this webinar, then uh, via the, um, the communications that we can send out afterwards. So go ahead, Dr. Jambaluka. Thank you. Aloha, can you hear me? I don't hear any nose. So, <laughs> uh, aloha, everyone. I want to thank the organizers um, for uh, putting this together and for inviting me to present, and thank all of you for uh, joining this session. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, some of the issues that Alan uh, brought up during his uh, excellent talk, and uh, let me get started right away, uh, see if I can get mine done on time as well. I have a lot to show you. First of all, I just want to tell you that I'm um, director of Water Resources Research Center. So I'm uh, fortunate to be uh, leading this small but really excellent uh, organization that does all manner of water resources research for Hawaii and American Samoa. Uh, here are uh, our uh, faculty and staff. And um, we are one of 54 such centers uh, sponsored uh, in part. Uh, by the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, these centers are in each state and territory at research universities. Um, and some of them, including us, have more than one jurisdiction. So we are, as I said, Hawaii and American Samoa. Uh, we cover quite a range of uh, 
expertise from climate to water quality, geothermal energy, ecosystem processes, uh, hydrogeophysics, land atmosphere interaction, and advanced modeling techniques. And all of our work um, <clears throat> is, uh, can be characterized as having different mixes of field observations, lab analysis, and data analysis and modeling. Now, in addition to my job at Water Resources, I also lead an outstanding group of uh, graduate students and postmasters and postdocs who have worked for me for a long time, in many cases, in uh, the geography and environment department. Uh, so I'll just show you some of those folks. And uh, in my own lab then, which is, we sometimes refer to as the, uh, as the uh, uh, ecohydrology lab, we cover a range of topics, uh, mainly under these four bullets of climate, climate change, hydrology, and ecohydrology. And ecohydrology refers to processes that involve plants in, in the water cycle, basically. Okay, so today I'm going to try to cover these four topics. All of the work that I'm going to present here uh, is, with the exception of uh, just an introductory slide on a previous study, are going to be based on um, research that we have done within my lab. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about evapotranspiration, focusing on differences between uh, two sites, one with um, one that's been invaded by strawberry guava and the other that is uh, a native forest site. I'm going to talk about the uh, Maui transpiration study that Alan mentioned. Um, I am going to give a few slides on the topic of how climate change might affect um, invasive species and how those invasive species affect water. And lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about cloud water interception, some of the work we're doing on that. I do want to quickly mention the sponsors and partners that enable our work. There's a, a long list, uh, actually much too long to include here, but here are some of the main ones that um, have either uh, funded our projects or helped us in other ways, such as providing access to land and giving us other uh, kinds of support. Uh, particularly, would like to thank um, the Pacific Islands Ecosystem Research Center and Gordon Tribble, who has supported our work for many years, and currently the um, PICAS, Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center. But also, all the others here on this list are really important to us. So get started right away on evapotranspiration. Uh, first of all, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, ET or evapotranspiration is uh, the sum of transpiration and evaporation. And transpiration is the part of that that the plants can exert the most control over. Uh, evaporation, on the other hand, can be affected by the plants in a particular uh, site, but less so than transpiration. It, it's more the uh, the structural characteristics of the vegetation that can affect this. And we often separate the evaporation into two parts, wet canopy evaporation, which is what occurs during and after a rain event or a fog event, uh, when the canopy is wet, when the leaves and the stems are wet, uh, and then evaporation of water out of the moist soil, which is usually a pretty small component in a forest, Close canopy forest, but can be a large portion of the total ET in a place with sparse vegetation. <clears throat> so the reason we're interested in evapotranspiration is that it is a major component of the water cycle. Um, and as Alan explained, it can affect the parts of the cycle that are really important to us, such as groundwater recharge and stream flow. So we you know, we know that higher evapotranspiration will result in reduced groundwater recharge and reduced stream flows. So we're kind of focusing our attention on invasive species because we suspect that they promote higher rates of evapotranspiration. So looking at transpiration, which is the part that can be most controlled by plants, and we would suspect this is the part that would, would potentially change the most if you have a species invasion. So 
Transpiration is a process that plants have to um, carry out. Plants have to open their stomata, the pores in the leaves, to allow CO2 to enter the leaf. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, essential for plant survival. It has to get CO2 to conduct photosynthesis. But when the stomata are open, that allows water to escape as transpiration. We know that some invasive species grow fast, faster than we think, faster than most native species, and this may give them a, an advantage that causes them to be invasive. So we suspect then that they tend to keep their stomata open more than native plants, or they could have generally more leaf area than native plants, which would have the same effect. So the question is, do fast-growing invasive trees use more water than native trees? And we have been trying to answer this question for a long time, as you'll see. Um, and we do have some answers, but we really don't have the complete answer yet. Now, um, Molly Cavallari and Lauren Sack, about 10 years ago, published a really nice paper where they did um, kind of meta-analysis of the literature, all the papers in the literature, where there were um, pairwise studies of native and invasive plants all over the world. <clears throat> and they put them in this graph. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but uh, this larger graph um, shows the, um, the stomatal conductance. This is um, the rate at which these plants allow gas to be exchanged with the leaves. And so uh, if it's higher, that would mean higher photosynthesis, but also it would mean higher transpiration. And the ones that have bars above are showing cases where in these pairwise comparisons, the invasive plants had higher um, gas exchange than the uh, native plant at the same site. And you see that you know, the, the majority of the pairs studied the native that the invasive plant had higher gas exchange rates than the native plant. And we see the same thing up here, which is photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is higher for these native, for the non-native plants, the invasive plants, than it is for the native plants in many cases, and to a higher magnitude. So in both these cases, more and greater magnitude of difference as you, uh, on the side of invasive greater than, greater than native. So we have uh, been working on this in numerous projects. One is um, a long-term study that has been sponsored by many grants, many uh, funding from many funding sources over a long period of time, starting around 2004 when we started building these towers. So we selected two sites to compare uh, the processes in a native forest, and that's the one shown uh, down below, and that's the site um, that is very close to Thurston Lava Tube in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And the other site is in another part of the same park called the Ola'a Track, and it is an area that was at one time very similar um, with an Ohia forest, but has now been heavily invaded by strawberry guava. And we set up these towers in the two sites and we started making measurements and we made many different types of measurements and we continue to uh, conduct observations at, at these two sites. I'm going to show some of the results from these two sites. What I'm going to show is, um, first of all, results from our eddy covariance measurements. And these are very specialized um, types of measurements that allow us to measure the stand level gas exchange. And so we can get the water vapor exchange, which we can basically equate with evapotranspiration over, over the whole stand, over a footprint upwind of the tower. So it's kind of averaging a, an area that extends out several hundred meters. And also the photosynthesis and respiration and kind of net photosynthesis, which we get by uh, calculating the uh, transport or uh, the exchange of carbon dioxide between the ecosystem and the atmosphere. So, you know, uh, skipping over years of backbreaking uh, work at, in the field and doing data analysis, uh, kind of complicated data analysis, this is showing uh, one way of summarizing the results for evapotranspiration. The upper graph, uh, in both graphs actually, what you're seeing 
each of these cycles that you see on the graph is the mean, the average daily cycle or diurnal cycle of a, of a particular month. So there's just thousands and thousands of observations that go into this. Um, and you see it varying you know, through the seasons and through the years. And this is the native site, and it's aligned in time with uh, the values for, uh, for the, uh, the graph for the invaded site. So we set the tower up and got it started at the native site in February 2005. And about a year later, we got the uh, tower operating at the invaded site in Ola. Now, if we take the average of each of these uh, 30 minute values in this mean annual, mean diurnal cycle for each month, we can get the monthly average values. And that's what's shown on the next slide. And what I've done here is that rather than just show the evapotranspiration, since these sites are similar but not exactly the same, uh, one of the principal drivers of evapotranspiration is uh, the available energy, which is provided primarily by solar radiation by the sun. So what I've done here is divided the evapotranspiration energy by the available energy. So it, this, this, uh, the values in this graph give us the, um, the, the proportion of uh, energy available that is used for evapotranspiration at each site. So the red line with, uh, with the squares is showing the monthly values for the invaded site and the blue line with, uh, with the circles is showing for the native site. And we see that the average proportion, see most of the time um, the invaded site has, uses a higher proportion of its available energy for evapotranspiration than does the native site. And the averages are about 42.5% for the invaded site and around 30% for the uh, native site. And that tells us that if they had the same amount of energy, then the um, invaded site would be using more water, evapotranspiring more water. So that difference is about a 43% greater amount uh, at the uh, invaded site. And so we can say that under the same radiation conditions, we would expect, based on these results, that the invaded site would use uh, something like 43% more water than the native site. <clears throat> But is the ET, evapotranspiration, higher at the invaded site because of the presence of strawberry guava? Uh, that our invaded site is not a, a monotypic standard strawberry guava. It is about 40 or 50 percent strawberry guava. It has some remaining large ohia trees. It has a lot of hapu, um, the tree ferns, native tree ferns. And so it's really hard to say. And so, you know, what differences between these two sites are causing the higher evapotranspiration? We can take leaf level measurements uh, to give us a clue because uh, by measuring gas exchange at the leaf level, we can say what's happening for each of the species at a given site. And so we have done some of those measurements at various sites, including the two sites in this study. Um, and so we want to know are the gas exchange characteristics of the principal native species at our native site, which is Ohia, and the principal non-native species at the non-native site, guava, strawberry guava, are they significantly different? At our hoplo sites, the answer so far is no. <clears throat> They're not different based on the measurements we've taken so far. So I, I will uh, give one caveat there that <clears throat> we've only been able so far to take these measurements during one season, and we would like to replicate those measurements, especially in uh, the summer season, which we haven't done yet. <clears throat> but we do have some results from another site here on Oahu by um, one of my grad students, uh, who's just about to defend her PhD, Aurora Kagawa Viviani, who um, has found at a Makaha site, this is a, a study sponsored by Honolulu Board of Water Supply, that the guava there had significantly higher gas exchange rates than the native trees at that site, which were not Ohia in that case, in that somewhat drier environment. But again, it did look like at the leaf level, at least at some sites, the guava does promote higher gas exchange rates. So what we can say so far from the ET analysis at the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park uh, sites 
The normalized ET, in other words, the evapotranspiration divided by the available energy is higher at the embedded site, but we're not certain that the higher ET is due to the high, to, due to high transpiration by strawberry guava. The other thing that this, we, we have to remind ourselves is that this study, despite all the effort and the many years we put into it, is still just a single pair of sites and not very well controlled sites at that, that this study is not sufficient to really answer the questions about possible impacts of invasive plants in Hawaii. So what are the ways we can do this? Um, we can do sap flow studies, which can also isolate the amount of uh, water used by individual trees, and therefore we can associate them with particular species. And we have done this, uh, including the um, Makaha study that I just mentioned. Uh, we have done it at the Habo sites. I don't have time to present that here. Um, but if we do this for paired sites, as we uh, set out to do in the study with USGS, we set out to identify sites to do that. Um, we get a lot of uh, value from those sites for, for those particular sites. We get a lot of information, but it is expensive and time consuming to set up continuous monitoring to do that. And it takes many years. And therefore, it would be necessarily limited to a few number of paired sites and therefore limited in the number of species we could look at and the number of different uh, environments we could uh, conduct these studies in. So another way to do it in, that would be complementary to continuing with paired site studies uh, would be a modeling approach based on either leaf level or leaf level gas exchange measurements or branchlet transpiration. So making um, sap flow measurements at the branchlet, at the ends of the branches. Um, and this is less expensive and we can do this in a short amount of time at each site and then move from site to site and get extensive coverage. Um, and this is the um, this is a uh, a uh, kind of a, an approach that we are advocating to pair with the um, with the existing paired plot studies uh, as we go forward. It does depend on having good species distribution maps, and this was something that was brought up by Alan as one of the things that they have on their their list to try to get done. So we cannot really use this method to fully answer the questions unless we can. Uh, scale up using good species distribution maps. So uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, what we did on Maui. Uh, this work was done uh, with um, in, in collaboration with uh, Alan Mayer and Joe Kennedy and others at the uh, Pacific Island Water Science Center, USGS. Um, and it involved uh, my grad students, Leah Portner and Aurora Kagawa Viviani, who did field measurements. And the measurements that they took were leaf area index, which is the, um, the total leaf area divided by the ground area, and photosynth photosynthesis measurements that allow us to get photosynthetic photosynthesis response curves that can be used in a model to estimate transpiration. So the advantage of this is. These measurements can be done at a site in a day or two, rather than taking years to set up instrumentation and monitor, monitor it over a long time. So here are the results. Uh, first of all, this is the leaf area, and um, the bars are, uh, the green colored bars are for the native species, and the reddish brown bars are for the non-native or the invasive species at each of these sites. There are four sites, all on Maui, uh, and you see the different species that we were able to study at each site. And what you'll notice from this graph is that there's a tendency for the stands dominated by non-native species, by invasive species, to have higher leaf area than the native species at the same site, stands dominated by native species at the same site. So this is seen at three out of the four sites. Um, and this is important because leaf area is one of the main controls on the evapotranspiration rate. More leaf area means more transpiration. So taking that information and the leaf level of gas exchange measurements, the photosynthesis measurements, 
uh, Yoshi Miyazawa, also from my lab, uh, collaborating with my lab. Um, estimated transpiration for each species um, at each of these sites. And again, what you can see is that, um, first of all, the green bars are for the native species, native trees, and the, um, the reddish brown bars are for the invasive species. And you see at three out of the four sites, um, higher transpiration, in some cases, significantly higher transpiration for the invasive species. So um, USGS, uh, Alan Mayer and others, uh, you know, in trying to interpret this data, uh, suggested that we look at the maximum potential change in transpiration, which is shown here. So if we take at each site the lowest value for the native species and the highest value for non-native species, that difference is the maximum change you would get by either causing invasion or by eradicating invasive species, be changing in the other direction. And if we take those numbers and compare them to the mean daily precipitation at each of the sites, we can get an idea of how important these differences are. And so that's what's shown here. The red bars are the maximum potential change in transpiration, and the blue bars are the mean daily rainfall. And you can see that at uh, most of these sites, this potential change is a significant amount in relation to the total water balance of the site. And so this, this tells us that these effects on our water balance by invasive species can be important, at least at some sites. <clears throat> Okay, so in summary for this particular study, um, this transpiration study, we, we did find generally higher leaf area for the non-native uh, species, the pots for the non-native species, especially strawberry guava, Christmas berry, and ginger. Um, the, leaf, the leaf level gas exchange characteristics uh, were different for native and non-native species, and they contributed to the differences in transpiration. Transpiration was generally higher for the non-native stands. And this difference in transpiration was, uh, at least in part, or maybe even largely an effect of the higher leaf area of these non-native stands. So this is something we are going to focus more of our attention on as we move forward. So implications here are that, um, you know, the higher transpiration non-native uh, plots suggest a negative water resource impact due to, uh, you know, the, the water use that is going to uh, the atmosphere rather than going into our groundwater and streams. Um, but we cannot really extrapolate these beyond the species that were uh, studied or outside the conditions of those sites. We need to sample more native and non-native species across their full ranges of climate and other influential conditions in order to really answer the, the key questions here about the impacts of uh, species invasion on our water resources. <clears throat> These paired plot sap flow studies that we've done, uh, such as for Havo and at uh, Makaha, and we're currently doing um, in the Kowals and another border water supply sponsored study are really essential to fully understand the differences between our native and non-native species, but we need to pair those um, with, we need to use those paired plot studies together with uh, a more extensive approach, which is to take those paired plot sites as anchor stations and then do spatially extensive studies of leaf gas exchange or branchlet level sat flow uh, and develop statistical models of transpiration for each species and apply them across the landscape. So this is really our goal going forward is to um, design a study that can really answer these questions once and for all. Okay, I wanna just say a few words about what we've been able to find uh, in our studies about how climate change will affect uh, these processes that we've been talking about, transpiration, for example, um, and also how it can affect the competition between native and non-native 
species in our forests. Um, so in other words, we know it's gonna get warmer. It will, what will happen in a warmer climate? Well, the difference between transpiration of native and non-native um, trees increase or will they become more similar in, under those conditions? And will the competitive advantage and growth rates uh, of our invasive plants uh, become greater under warmer or sunnier or drier or wetter conditions in the future. Um, we'd like to try to figure that out. So again, from our uh, two tower sites in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, and, and I'm skipping over a lot of other analysis, uh, this is one of the main results that is of interest. Let me see if I can, uh, there we go. Um, so what we're seeing here is the uh, evapotranspiration on the y-axis and the available energy or net radiation on the x-axis. So as the net radiation goes up, the available energy goes up at either of the two sites. And again, the squares um, with the, the brown lines around them um, are the, the invaded site and the green circles are the native site. You see that for both sites, as the available energy goes up, the evapotranspiration goes up. But there's a difference in that the invasive site, invaded site, is uh, has a steeper slope, which means that it is more sensitive to changes in the available energy. So this is based on two sites uh, over time, and so these are different months. Uh, so the months that had um, uh, less than, let's say, around 120 watts per square meter of net radiation. Um, there was not a there was not higher evapotranspiration by uh, the invaded site. In fact, there was lower. So, oops, sorry. There we go. So, in this case, the the native ET for these months, the native site ET was higher than the invaded site. When we look at on the other side, um, months where the net radiation was higher than 120 watts per square meter. That's where the invaded, the ET at the invaded site was higher. And the higher the, the radiation is, the more that difference uh, can be seen. So that is basically telling us that on during sunny months or during summer months, this difference was greater and more, more water was used in the invaded site than native site, more and more. So thinking about that for the future, one way to interpret this is to say, well, if we think the future is gonna be cloudy, cloudier than it is now we're going to have more clouds of wetter kind of future uh, climate future then we wouldn't expect the uh, negative impacts of um, species invasion on water resources to get worse in fact they might get better it might be a benefit uh, to water but if we think it's going to get sunnier or in places where we think it's going to get sunnier this problem is going to get worse and the negative effects of species invasion are going to become greater Another way to think about that in the present tense is that right now, places that are cloudier are probably not as important in terms of the potential impacts of um, species invasion on water, at least in terms of evapotranspiration, than sunnier places. So this also highlights the need for us to look across the landscape to see how the effects of invasion vary in different environments. Now, from those uh, tower measurements that we made, we're also able to um, look at the photosynthesis. And so this is the photosynthetic rate for different months for the invaded site and native site as a function of the light level, the amount of, amount of sunlight coming in on the x-axis. And you see that the growth rate or the photosynthetic rate is higher for the invaded site all the time. Um, but as the light level increases, again, that differential gets greater. And that tells us if we think it's going to be sunnier in the future, then this problem, this, this suggests anyway that the advantages that the, this particular invasive species has anyway will increase under those conditions. If we think it's going to get cloudier, then it may close the gap and the advantage may be reduced. Okay, lastly, I'm just gonna talk real quickly about 
cloud water interception or fog drift, and we've been studying this for a long time. Um, first, I'll talk a little bit about um, a study done by Mami Takahashi, who was a master's student in my lab about 10 years ago. And um, she used uh, measurements that we took at the two uh, White Volcanoes National Park sites uh, and applied this single layer canopy water balance model to isolate the amount of water intercepted from fog. And just cutting to the chase here, um, she found that the native site near Thurston Lava Tube had much higher cloud water interception than the invited site, despite the fact that the fog frequency is actually much lower here than it is at the invaded site. So we interpret this to mean, or at least we think it suggests that the structure, the architecture of the native trees at that site, which are dominated by Ohia, are much more effective at capturing uh, fog being blown through the canopy by wind than the native species, or than the uh, guava at the uh, invaded site. Currently, we're working on a study that's uh, being uh, led by my graduate student, Han Seng, PhD student. Uh, and we're looking at five different sites. We're not looking at native versus non-native in this site, but we will be producing lots of new information about cloud water interception, and we will try to um, make statewide maps of cloud water interception for the first time as, uh, based on the results of this study. Her study includes five sites, as I mentioned, on three islands. It's quite ambitious, and um, the field portion of this is coming to an end. Shortly, but uh, and we expect to have some results in the, in the coming months. At each of her sites, there's a range of measurements being taken, but again, we're not specifically looking at native versus non-native species in this in this particular study. I'm going to skip ahead here. This is some of the measurements she's taking. Uh, her preliminary results. Uh, give us an idea of the importance of cloud water interception at each of these five sites across the island. And you can see uh, the kind of orange portion of the bars give the cloud water interception and the blue give the rainfall. You can see how much difference the cloud water makes to the total amount of water at these sites. So we know it's important. So where we stand, amount of water intercepted uh, from fog is significant. We know that trees are better at intercepting fog than low vegetation, but we have questions. Um, if if uh, a pasture in the fog zone is restored to forest, will the added water from the input of fog capture be higher than the increased water loss by evapotranspiration? So when you convert from pasture to forest to trees, you increase the evapotranspiration and that takes water away. But if you're adding water with by capturing more fog, you know, which one is greater? We don't know. We'd like to know that. Um, native species such as Ohia seem to be better at catching fog, but is that generally true for Ohia and other sites? And is it true for other native trees? And lastly, how will climate change affect cloud water interception? And I just have a couple of comments on this. I know I'm running a little over. I apologize for that. Just a couple more slides here. Um, this is uh, from a paper published this year, uh, led by Aurora Kagawa Viviani, PhD student in my lab, on temperature change in Hawaii. And she found this re these really interesting results for sea level temperature that temperature is going up very, very fast at sea level. Uh, this is the daytime maximum, this is nighttime minimum, both going up fast over a long period of time. But she also found that there are spatial differences in the islands, and this is reflected in this environmental lapse rate. This is the rate that uh, it gets cooler as you go up a mountain, um, and that's what's been on the on the y-axis. Time, getting some some feedback. Uh, can somebody. Hear me? Uh, thank you. Uh, so since about the late 1970s, this environmental lapse rate has been going up. And that means that in the cloud zone, it's basically not cooling uh, and may actually 
and not, not warming. It may actually be cooling. And why is that? Because we have generalized warming everywhere due to global warming. So what is countering the warming in the cloud layer? We were able to look at this, and Aurora did some in-depth studies. We found that it is caused by drying of the lower atmosphere, which was kind of surprising. We didn't expect that. And that's causing the cloud base to rise. Rising air cools faster below the cloud base than it does above the cloud base. And that accounts for the cooler, the cooling effect above the previous cloud base level. And that accounts for why the cloud level is not warming. It's being canceled out by this effect. So the possible big effects of this increasing cloud base height on water resources, and very obviously, the thinner clouds will give us less cloud water interception. Maybe this also accounts for the reduction in rainfall we've seen in recent decades and will affect ecosystem health in, in the cloud forest. So th this is the independent uh, data that Aurora was able to analyze that shows that at, um, at Hilo and Lihue, surface humidity is going down, it's getting drier. The lift is the lifting condensation level, which is a calculation of the base of the clouds, is going up at both uh, sites. And this is the uh, measured cloud base using uh, the, from instruments at airports that measure the height of the base of the clouds, and it shows that it's going up. So this was kind of surprising, uh, and it does have big implications for cloud water interception. So I'm going to end with that. Thanks very much for your attention and your patience at listening to this long, uh, this long presentation. Thanks so much, Tom, and thank you, Alan, before. Um, this is Laura Brewington. I'm one of the organizers of the webinar series and part of the working group. Um, thanks, everybody, for sticking with us. I know we're um, a few minutes behind time, but we have about seven minutes for questions. So I just want to go back to a question that was asked earlier. Um, where will the resources that Alan uh, mentioned in his presentation be posted? And currently, we are actually still a homeless working group. So we're trying to identify a, a longer term uh, web based solution. But for the time being, what we'll do is email any resources to the attendees of this webinar, um, along with the recording of the webinar as well. Um, we also just wanted to quickly thank everyone who responded to the recent survey um, about future webinar topics and suggestions, as well as suggestions for a name for our working group. There were some really great ones. And so we'll be, um, we'll be meeting in the near future to decide on what our next webinar topic will be and uh, what we're going to be calling ourselves from, the, from henceforth. Um, so I see in the chat there are already a couple of questions for the presenters. And if you're still on the, the webinar, please type in your questions for Alan or Tom. Um, Tom, the first question that I see goes to you. Um, has your modeling work incorporated the effects of increasing carbon dioxide on the number of stomata um, and evapotranspiration? Good question. Uh, we have looked at the um, effect of varying carbon dioxide on all the ecosystem processes at our two tower sites in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Uh, we did not see a, an, um, a um, significant effect um, based on, on those data. But I think your question applies more to a, a kind of longer term effect that would um, might play out as carbon dioxide concentrations increase and affect the morphology of leaves uh, over a long period of time. We have not studied that directly. That is an interesting question. Uh, but yeah, we don't have any results on that. Thanks, Tom. Um, there's a second question that I, I think was also inspired by your presentation, um, the higher leaf area causes more evapotranspiration, as your work has shown, but would it also cause an increase in captured fog drip in a setting like the cloud forest? Absolutely, yes. Um, so the, um, the the leaf area is, uh, you know, is providing storage for captured water by from fog or from rain that can be then evaporated from the wet canopy, and that. That evaporation takes place at a higher rate than transpiration because it's, it's not impeded by 
having to go through the uh, the stomata. Uh, and so by increasing the storage of water in the canopy, you will increase the um, the wet canopy evaporation. Absolutely. So yeah, so that's another way in which these invasive trees can increase the overall evapotranspiration. Thanks, Tom. And again, if anyone has questions for Tom or Alan, um, please type them in the chat. Um, I actually have a, a question I'd like to throw over to Alan, um, if Alan's still on, and that is, what kinds of uncertainty do we deal with um, when working with different climate projections um, and modeling these future water resources under um, different types of land use and land change impacts? Laura, can you clarify what types of uh, uncertainty? Sure, yeah, what? just a known, known that there's a range of different climate projections um, for the future for the state, for example, and how to how to explain that, how to kind of incorporate that in the modeling work and the, the way that we frame it to stakeholders. Yeah, okay. Um, we've been currently, our center has been working with a set of what we call high resolution downscaled climate projections and the way we've approached it is to look at the range of projections and um, based on the current currently available set for the state we're looking at around six or seven depending on the island um, and these are red, you know climate projections that are going down to 800 meter to one kilometer resolution and we have chosen in the work Today, for example, the recent work we did on Maui, we used a range of projections. So we chose based on the island-wide effect to, to uh, look at the effect of the driest scenario. And then we also looked um, at the wettest scenario and try to bracket that. And that's the way we've approached it. We do have some ongoing projects that are incorporating um, not only that aspect, the range, but also more near-term projections. So, for example, we have an ongoing project where we're looking at um, incorporating projections for mid-21st century because the projections we've used to date so far for the dry and the climate, excuse me, the dry and the wet climate scenarios all tend to come from the end of century. So now we have a, a, another study, like I said, to look at mid-21st mid, uh, century. Thanks, Alan. And that's something that we saw when um, managers in Hawaii responded to the survey as well, that they were interested in seeing more near-term um, climate projections within management timelines. Um, let's see, we've got a couple of minutes left. I want to um, quickly go through what question that's just come in. Um, so, you know, we, the managers, have been advocating for protecting native forests, partly because they act as a superior watershed. But the results may not show that non-native forests um, don't influence the difference in water infiltration. I think I got those double numbers right. Um, are there any points that we should focus on if we want to frame native forests as superior water producers compared to invaded forests? And I think that could go to either Alan or, or to Tom. Well. I can answer, I can take a, uh, the first response. The one thing I, I, I should have clarified in our, when we talked about how we use that information in the water budget model, right now, based on limited data, when we simulate the, let's say, ET in our water budget model, we are breaking down um, species type just in general categories. So we have a non-native forest and we have a native forest. And that's because we just don't have enough information to really get distinguished down to more species specific types of forest environments. Um, so what what that question is getting at is, you know, is ultimately do they affect recharge? And is there also an effect on runoff? And those are still questions that we're trying to address. And I think the Second part of that answer, I'll let Tom handle, and that you know depends on the effect of uh, ET, some of the issues that he was talking about, leaf area and, and transpiration from these different uh, non-native species environments. Thanks, Alan. Tom, do you want to make a few comments? Yeah, I just add to what Alan said. Um, we we don't have all the answers yet. We can't really um, give a, unfortunately, after all the work we put in, give really. Uh, Conclusive answers, 
but we do have enough data to say that it's very, at least very suggestive that some some non-native species, especially invasive trees, some invasive trees at least, do use more water than common, uh, you know, the predominant native trees that they're replacing. Um, I think we can say that with the, the evidence that we have right now. We also have at least some evidence that in the cloud zone that um, at least OHIA uh, captures fog at a, at, you know, a higher efficiency than, um, than, for example, strawberry guava. So I, I do think that given those two things, we can say that there's at least some evidence that um, these invasive trees are causing harm to our water resources. Great. Thanks to you both. And um, we're two minutes past 1.30, so in the interest of everyone's time, I apologize. We'll skip the last two questions, um, and I'll go ahead and wrap us up. Thank you so much to Dr. Mayer, Dr. John Beluca. It's great to see you all. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, and please stay tuned. We'll be communicating back to everyone in the group um, with the recording from today's webinar and the resources that were shared. So mahalo to you all, and see you next time. Thanks very much. Aloha. Thanks, everyone. Have a great mm -hmm. afternoon. Thanks, you guys.